Good evening. If you want to open your Bible to the book of Jeremiah, we've seen an introduction of this prophet, and we're going to spend most of our time observing this prophet, this uh, um, unusual prophet, it seems like. Throughout history, we've seen the influence that people that stood for something had and that we use them as examples that we are inspired by today. So tonight, we're going to roll back history and take a look at a lot of people that have influenced us through history all the way back until Jeremiah and see how even the prophet Jeremiah, somebody long before Christ, should influence us. Take George Washington, for example. We have this uh, painting that was made about him having a moment in prayer at Valley Forge. A man that was faithful and a general that was admired and will always be admired for his bravery. At some times, George Washington would be in battle and have his horse shot out from under him just to jump on another horse to continue to lead and organize the ranks. We really admire George Washington and his history. How about another man, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who we admire so much as a man that would not stop at anything for civil rights. A continual example for us and still in our history books as an influence that we admire. Even outside of the United States, William Wilberforce from a long time ago in the 1700s into the 1800s, who was influential in abolishing slavery across the sea. We still have this man as a history, as a leader, an influence. And roll it forward a little bit more, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who we've talked about so many times out of this pulpit and read books on, a man that would preach in Germany, Nazi Germany, and be arrested and die at the hands of Hitler. Throughout history, we've seen a lot of people that serve as an influence of people that would be faithful no matter what sort of consequence would come to them. Roll history back to the first century and there's an author of the book of Hebrews who's telling us about many people of faith that had been from almost the beginning of the world up until this point when he is writing and he's covered Abraham, he's covered Moses, and he makes this entry in the 11th chapter in the 32nd verse and says, What more shall I say for time would fail me to tell you of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, Samuel, and the prophets. There's too much here to tell you about, about people that were faithful until the very end, including the prophets, people of faith that stayed faithful even when delivering the message was not the message they really wanted to deliver. So Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, is a priest in the land of Benjamin, as we just read in our scripture reading of the first five verses of his books, is the prophet that gets called by God to deliver the message to his own people and it's not a happy message. It's not the good news message. In fact, it's actually the opposite. And it's not the message people want to hear. Much like Jonah, Jonah the man that got to spend some time inside of a fish, a unique experience that I don't think anybody else on earth will ever have besides this man and be able to tell about it, is eventually spat back out in a land that he didn't want to go to to deliver them a message that he didn't want to deliver but their reaction after just a few words as recorded in his own book, Jonah began to go into the city, going only a day's journey, and he called out, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Jonah went to a land in rebellion of God away from his own people to tell them, you can't be doing what you're doing and they hear those words, and they repent of it. And this was the message of Jonah, but Jeremiah was supposed to deliver the same message, not to a foreign land, but to his own people, and tell them, you can't be doing what you're doing in the eyes of God. I was expecting a repentance like a foreign land would do, 
but he gets the opposite reaction. And with every reaction that he gets to a message and a plea of coming back, he stays faithful no matter how many times he's canceled, how many times he's put in prison, how many times people come to lie to try to cover up his message. Those that were faithful to the truth throughout history, when it seemed that many were against them, if not, it seemed like everyone was against them or maybe that everything was falling apart are the examples that we admire. They're the influences through history that we continue to recall in sermons, in textbooks, in conversation to show these people were faithful to what was right and it seemed like nobody else got it. Maybe we should learn something from them. And so we're rolling back all the way before Christ to a time in the Old Testament when there's a people in a city and these people were supposed to be called by God as holy people, people set apart, people that were the example of who God was. But Jeremiah is the man that goes to tell them you're actually the opposite. In Jeremiah chapter one, we read the first five verses, but if we continue down through the rest of these verses, starting in verse six, after God has said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. He'll continue on. And Jeremiah responds even to this already and says, oh, Lord God, behold, I don't know how to speak. <laughs> For I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I am only a youth for you, excuse me, <clears throat> only a youth for to all to whom I send you, you shall go and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Don't be afraid of them for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put, uh, put out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I've set you this day over nations, over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Jeremiah seems like just another man. And even in his own eyes, he's like, look, I'm just a kid, God. <laughs> and God says, no, I'm giving you the words and I will send you out to your own people. And though you may be in Benjamin and though you might be a priest, though you might appear like a common person, to your own nation, just another priest, just another kid, just another man. Actually, you have an extraordinary message that I'm putting into your mouth for you to deliver. You might seem ordinary, but you have something extraordinary. And what you're gonna say and what I'm gonna tell you is gonna show that people can't live in sin and call it ordinary. And God will spend the next nine chapters showing Jeremiah the abominations of his own people. Telling them, you've broken covenant with me. Telling them, you've exercised injustice over your own people. Telling them, you don't even know what good is anymore, it seems like. What you call abomination is absolutely normal to you. In Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 12, it says this. Actually, I'm going to back up to verse 10. Jeremiah 8, verse 10. Therefore, I will, um, yeah, therefore, I will give their wives to others and their fields to conquerors because from the least to the greatest, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. From the prophet to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They have healed the wound of my people lightly saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace, when they, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed. Sin has become absolutely normal among the people that were supposed to be holy. It's as, as, as Paul would describe to the Ephesian church, a people that have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. We're fast forwarding a, a many years later where Paul is saying, there's people that don't even 
understand what sin is anymore. They've practiced it so much, it's like tough skin, they can't feel that area anymore. Or might even say to Timothy, the preacher in that town, the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars, whose consciences are seared. In fact, you can't even break into it. It's been melted over. It's been cauterized. It has no feeling. It's a scar that they're used to anymore. They're just used to all of the sin. Fast forward even further in history, the year is 1942, and there's a man in an SS uniform here, and his name is Kurt Gierstein. And this man right here, it was his duty that he found out to deliver poisonous gas to kill Jews. He was in charge of the shipments to get to the camps like Auschwitz. And when he discovers what's in his shipments, he gets to the point where he says, I know what this is doing. I'm responsible for delivering this. I'm responsible for what comes after this. What am I going to do now that I have the knowledge of this? Kurt actually loses his shipment and continues to deliver information to try to help stop the Holocaust. There's a lot of other history, actually, in the early life of Kurt that we'll visit in a little bit. But this feeling that he gets when he realizes what my actions are doing is killing tons of people. That conviction when he, that he has within himself calls him to do something that he is not doing. And that's about the feeling that Jeremiah the prophet gets when God is hammering on him over and over and over again, abomination, injustice, sin. In fact, the way that Jeremiah puts it in his own words is, I want to get out of here. I want to run away. Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Oh, that I had a desert a traveler's lodging place that I might leave my people and go away for them. For they are all adulterous in the company of treacherous men. I don't even want to be among my own people. Now that I realize how terribly dirty and sinful we are, just let me get away from them. Let me go be by myself in the wilderness and I'll actually open up a business that caters to people that aren't even my own people. It's so bad. I don't want to be around this. I want to run away from this. You see, the conviction that Jeremiah has about the sin of his own people, especially from the perspective of God, gives him a revelation of just the craving for holiness, the desire to move away from the abominations and into holiness. When we see sin as it is from God's perspective, an abomination to him, we should also want to run away and run into holiness. When we see sin from God's perspective, we should want to be separated from that. A place far away. But Jeremiah, since he's a prophet, doesn't get the option to run away. Actually, he's the man that now that he has the information gets to stay. And he gets to tell everybody else around him, his own people, what he knows and what God has delivered to him. Paul would also write in Romans, in the New Testament, how then will they call on him whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without some preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? 
as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. How will Jeremiah's own people know if he doesn't say anything? But Jeremiah doesn't necessarily have the gospel message this time. He doesn't have the good news. Actually, he's got the bad news. Because the news is that in your sin, it looks so bad that God is going to give you over to this neighboring nation. And that neighboring nation is on their way to come and break down your wall and to take you away. In fact, you don't look much different from them anyway. You're basically going to be a merger with them, and it's not going to be ideal. It's going to be terrible conditions for you. And they're on their way. That's not the message that Jeremiah necessarily wants to deliver, and it's certainly not the message that people want to hear. And so people that he is preaching to constantly come up with ways to try to say, don't say that to us. We don't want to have that message. In Jeremiah chapter 15, he says this, Therefore, thus says the Lord, if you return, I will restore you, and you shall stand before me. If you utter what is precious and not what is worthless, you shall be as my mouth. They shall turn to you, but you shall not turn to them, and I will make you to this people a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail over you, for I am with you to save you and to deliver you, declares the Lord. I will deliver you out of the hand of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the ruthless. The opportunity is here. Jeremiah is preaching from God. The opportunity is here is to turn from all this abomination and come to me. And if you do that, you can be strong and you will win this battle against this nation that's coming. The opportunity to repent is here before disaster comes over you. And Jeremiah gives this other message in chapter 19 where he takes this flask that God has instructed him to take. In Jeremiah 19, verse 1, it says, Thus says the Lord, go buy a potter's earthenware flask and take some of the elders of the people and some of the elders of the priests and go out to the valley of the son of Hinnom at the entry of the potsherd gate and proclaim there the words that I tell you. You shall say, hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I am bringing such disaster upon this place that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. Because the people have forsaken me, they have profaned this place by making offerings in it to other gods with whom neither they nor their fathers, the kings of Judah, have known. And because of this, they have filled this place with the blood of innocence, and it will continue to go on. And then at the end of this, Jeremiah is instructed to take this pot and he throws it on the ground and smashes it. And God says, this is what you will turn into. That's a way to get people's attention. You can see that Jeremiah probably earns the reputation of Mr. Doom and Gloom all the time. And it's just after he preaches this message and throws the pot on the ground that we roll into chapter 20. And there's a priest and his name is Peshur. And he's the chief officer in the house of the Lord. And when he hears Jeremiah prophesying about these things, actually these words, he takes Jeremiah the prophet, beats him, and puts him in the stocks that are in the upper gate of the house of the Lord. Wow, what a response. The people wouldn't put their stocks in faith, but they'll put the faithful one in the stocks when he tells the truth. And even when Jeremiah gets out in that very chapter, it's the next day, Bashir lets him go. Jeremiah just has more truth to reveal right away. This isn't enough stop the words of the Lord. And this isn't enough to stop the message that he is trying to get across to you. If you'll just hear it. Jeremiah 26, three, he keeps going. This is God saying, it may be that they will listen and everyone turn from his evil way that I may relent of the disaster that I intend to do them because their evil deeds. The Southern nation Babylon is on their way to you. And in Jeremiah 26, after saying some more words like this, people want to kill Jeremiah. This is moved beyond imprisonment and into a death sentence. And after somebody remembers another prophet, Micah, it's like maybe we shouldn't. 
And then in Jeremiah chapter 32, we see Jeremiah is in prison and preaching some more. And then Jeremiah chapter 36, 7, since Jeremiah is in prison, he sends somebody else to go preach the message now. It may be that their plea for mercy will come before the Lord and that everyone will turn from their evil way. For great is the anger and the wrath of the Lord has pronounced against these people. And to this, Jeremiah is back in prison once again. Getting a little repetitive here with Jeremiah's life. And then in Jeremiah chapter 37, Jeremiah actually gets to have a word with the actual king. This is King Zedekiah actually sends for him and is asking, what is the Lord saying? And Jeremiah replies, you will be delivered into the hands of the king of Babylon. Babylon's pounding at the door at this very moment, trying to break the wall down. Everything that you wanted to ignore for all of these times that Jeremiah has sent the message to you, you ignored it, and now Babylon is here. The nation is here to take you away. You will be delivered into the king of Babylon. And Jeremiah said to the king Zedekiah, what crime have I committed against you or your attendants or this people that you've put me in prison? Where are your prophets who have prophesied to you? The king of Babylon will not attack you or this. And then in chapter 38, Jeremiah is thrown into a hole in the ground. And they're just going to leave him there to die. He's pulled out. And he's put back in a, in a guard, in a guard house. And then in chapter 39, what Jeremiah has been saying all this time for 38 chapters across kings, across priests, across years of his life comes to fruition. And in chapter 39, in the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the 10th month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came into Jerusalem and besieged it. The message was available. The message from the very beginning was, look what you're doing. Look how bad this is in God's eyes. Turn away from this. And God will be with you and save you. And ever so patiently, God calls to them again, re repent from this. And patiently, Jeremiah sends somebody else again, have, cry out for mercy. This is utter stubborn. But Jeremiah would never give up no matter how many stocks, how many prisons, how many cisterns, it didn't matter where they put him. He was given the word of truth and he wasn't going to stop delivering that truth. He was going to be faithful to it no matter what situation he was in. Living faithfully to the truth is a lifestyle that rejects any temptation to compromise it, any reward to compromise it, or any relief to compromise it. Fast forward, at the time of Christ, John the Baptist has told Herod, it's not right for you to have your brother's wife. And both Herod and his brother's wife, who are now together, don't like the message, so they put John in prison. And eventually John will be beheaded for this truth here. Fast forward again. Dr. King Jr. was faithful to the truth when he recognized something was wrong. And no matter how many times he was going to be arrested, he wasn't going to stop saying, this is wrong and this needs to change. As Franklin D. Roosevelt one of our past presidents would say on a radio show, repetition does not transform a lie into truth. It doesn't matter how much you want to reject this message. It doesn't matter how many times Jeremiah went and they said, you're really ruining the morale around here. 
it doesn't matter how many times you want to push it away. That truth will always be the truth. And it doesn't matter how many times you lie to yourself and say it's not the truth, it's still the truth. And as George Washington would say, truth will ultimately prevail where there are pains to bring it to light. Living faithful to the truth is a lifestyle. And it's not worth compromising for any temptation, reward, or relief. Rewind back to the New Testament now. Jesus has ascended. He's come to die to save all mankind. And Peter, the man that was also one that thought he was going to run away, when he denied Christ three times, has had a transforming faith and a courage, and now he's the one to preach the message in Acts chapter 2 that says, you killed the Messiah. Acts chapter 2, verse 36, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is the reaction that Jeremiah wanted from his own people. But here is Peter now delivering it to Israel once again and saying, you've done something terribly wrong. But now instead of destruction, there's salvation to be had for this. Jesus Christ will save you. It was a conviction of sin followed by salvation when Peter sinned. And no matter how many times he went into prison, the truth was the truth and he could not help but proclaim it. Same with the Apostle Paul at his conversion in Acts chapter 9 when he realized, I'm kicking against the goads here. This is pretty hard. Has a transformation and all he can do, no matter if it was prison, shipwreck, up into his death, this is the truth and I have to stick with this and proclaim this. No matter how many times people want to cancel this. And for the rest of the word, it is the truth and it is convicting no matter how much we read it and sometimes want to push it away from us. We'll never change what it is. It reveals to us the perspective of sin from God's perspective. It reveals to us that conviction of sin should be followed by repentance. I don't want to do this anymore. And followed up with salvation from the things that we've done. It's a message not for destruction, but meant for salvation. It's the message that's been carried throughout the world up until today that has shown leaders how to stay faithful. And it will never go away. We must accept a message that identifies a demand for repentance and a message that offers relief and peace. We don't get the good things without identifying the bad things. We don't get the transformation without realizing where we're coming from and where we need to go. We might not always like the bad things and the things that we need to change, but when we accept these things, we move to the good things. And so we've gone back and forth through history and we've looked at snapshots over and over and over again. And we could close by looking once again at Hebrews chapter 11 
rolling into chapter 12 and saying all these that realize that they put all of their stock in the truth, all of their stock in the faith, even when they went to the stocks themselves are in the cloud of witness that observe us and say, run the race, run truly, run faithfully. Jesus Christ is there to give you the real reward in the end. And nothing will be worth compromising until that day. I want you to be convicted about the things that are detestable to God so that you can move to the salvation that that same God provides. And whether that's for the first time in baptism, as we just read in Acts 2, or whether that's a recognition of right now, I need to return to my merciful God, as they didn't do in Jeremiah, but they wanted to do in Acts. I'll offer that to you now. I invite you to come as we stand and sing, I gave my life for thee.